Welcome, everyone. Um, you are at Becoming a Democracy, um, how we are going to fix the Electoral College, gerrymandering, and our elections with Kristen Eberhard. And I just want to let everybody know that um, I'm Cindy Black, the Executive Director of Fix Democracy First. So Kristen is the Director of Climate and Democracy at the Sightline Institute and a proud policy wonk and a member of Sightline's management team. She researches, writes about, and speaks about climate change policy and democracy reform. She is known as a leading expert on electoral reform in the Pacific Northwest and is considered an authority on proportional representation as well as carbon pricing. Before joining Sightline, Kristen worked at the Natural Resources Defense Council, leading its California climate work in San Francisco, then moving to its Southern California office to help the largest municipality, municipally owned utility in the country to get off coal and onto energy efficiency and renewables. She also taught courses on climate change and energy law at Stanford Law School and UCLA School of Law. Kristen graduated with honors from Stanford University, cum laude from Duke University of Law, and earned a master's of environmental management from Duke's Nicholas School of the Environment. She lives and works in Portland with her husband and sons. So welcome, Kristen. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We're very excited about tonight's topic, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay, thank you so much for having me, Cindy, and thank all of you for uh, being here tonight. Uh, to talk about my new book, uh, Becoming a Democracy, How We Can Fix the Electoral College Gerrymandering and Our Elections. So the book looks at 10 proven solutions, no constitutional amendment needed, no change in the courts needed, and most of them don't even need Congress. They can be implemented at the state level. In fact, many of these are already implemented here in the Pacific Northwest. So the book lays out the problems that were designed into our system from low turnout to big money to unequal representation. But the main thrust is to describe the solutions and hopefully to get readers involved in spreading those solutions across the country. Um, so the book is designed so you can, you can pick it up and read it cover to cover, get the full history and context, or you could just flip right to the chapter of the issue that you care most about and find out what's going on with that. Um, so tonight, I am going to focus on three chapters and those three solutions, vote by mail, ranked choice voting, and the Electoral College. And I'm going to assume that um, many of you already know what's going wrong with our system. So I'm going to focus on what we could do right and where we are already making progress. Um, so towards that end, we had a record voter turnout this year. 150 million Americans voted, including more than 100 million who voted early or by mail, which is fantastic. Um, but this election also showed us some things that really should be working better in one of the most established democracies in the world. So that includes even with that huge 150 million turnout, there were still people who were not able to vote, um, whose vote didn't make a difference. And of course, we all experienced this excruciating wait to find out who won the election, even after it was very clear that one candidate had millions more votes than the other. Um, why do these things happen in the United States? Well, let's dive into some solutions for making it better. Okay, so uh, vote by mail, also known as vote at home, is a solution that when done right, makes voting accessible to more people. Um, and we, we know that here where we have, um, we always have high turnout in Washington and Oregon in part because we make it easy for people to vote. And when more people vote, then it's more likely that we can elect officials who are responsive to people and it also gives people more trust in our institutions of government and their legitimacy to act on people's behalf. In contrast, when people need to show up at a polling place on a Tuesday in November, that can make it harder to vote. And then if you add on top of that, states close polling places or they have fewer machines or not enough workers at certain polling places. And pretty soon you get 10 hour lines, which we saw in Georgia this year. 
And when voters have to wait that long to exercise their right to vote, they start getting the message that maybe it's not a right. Maybe their vote isn't so important. Um, they get the message that they're the ones who are having to prove themselves. They're having to plan it out, pack snacks, arrange a day off from work, pay for childcare, and then wait all day into the night just to get to the front of that line and vote. And not everyone can wait. And not everyone is willing to keep doing that year after year. So every time that happens, our democracy is weakened a little bit. Those voices are lost. And really importantly, those vo voters' trust in the system is diminished. So we need every voice. We need people to be able to just show up and have their vote count and to believe in the institutions that result from their vote. Um, so uh, helping more people vote safely and easily with vote at home can help. And the, the idea of vote by mail or vote by home was born here in Oregon where I live and officials here in Oregon and in Washington have had decades to perfect this. Um, we uh, give a very helpful voter pamphlet, postage prepaid return envelopes, lots of drop boxes for people to drop off at, very clear instructions and more. And while every state makes it possible for at least some people to vote by mail sometimes. Um, this practice is stronger here in the West. So in this map, the dark green states, Oregon, Washington, Utah, Colorado, and Hawaii, all mail ballots out to every voter for every election. And you can see the, the next green, many other Western states conduct at least some elections all by mail. And west of the Mississippi, almost every state lets any voter request a mailed ballot for any reason. Um, but you'll see the lightest green states, there's sort of this swath in the South and Appalachia um, where states and, and a few states in New England that prevent voters from voting by mail unless they have a particular approved excuse. So what we saw this year with coronavirus um, threatening um, the safety of voters or poll workers at crowded polling places was states started to expand early voting and vote by mail um, to make sure that their voters could vote safely. So uh, six states, California, Nevada, Montana, Vermont, New Jersey, and DC uh, mailed ballots to all voters um, for the 2020 election. And um, another seven states waived their excuse requirement so any voter could request a ballot. So looking at this table at, on the, the far left side, the darkest green states are the ones that make it easiest to vote by mail. On the far right side, the lightest green are the ones who uh, make it the hardest. And what we saw this year is these highlighted states essentially moved to the left. So we kind of saw this surge of, of states moving to make it easier to vote by mail. And part of the result of that was a record breaking 50 million people voting by mail in 2020. So what we're hoping is that as those states made those changes and experienced it working and their voters experienced it working, that we will be able to see um, to make some of these improvements stick for future elections and will continue to make it easier for voters across the country, not just in the West to vote by mail. Now that said, there were some great successes, um, but there were still some glitches. Not every state is using best practices for vote by mail that we use here in Oregon and Washington. So the, the big example here is North Carolina. Uh, North Carolina insisted on requiring their voters to find a witness to sign their envelope and print their name and their address on, on the voters envelope. So not only is this witness requirement just, it's unnecessary, it's a, it's a barrier to voting, but um, on top of that, the, the envelope was just confusing. And so some voters um, didn't complete it correctly and their, even though they voted, their vote did not count. So here's the return envelope. You can see um, there are two fields that, well, as you can see this, there's a lot of text, right? There's three steps, lots of text under each of those steps, but there are two fields that are highlighted and, and have an X. So it's pretty visually clear. You need to fill those two out. <laughs> but there's these other two fields that are gray and don't have an X. 
Um, so it's not as clear that those were mandatory and without them, your vote wouldn't count. Um, so not surprisingly, there were tens of thousands of voters in North Carolina who didn't get their witness to fill out those two um, additional fields um, and that threatened their ability to have their vote count. So in contrast, um, here in Oregon and Washington, we make it easy. Voters have to do one thing. They just they have to sign their own envelope and the envelope design is very clear. It shows them exactly where to sign. So we know how to do this. We know how to make it possible for voters to vote from home safely and easily. Um, we just need to export these best practices um, to other states so that people across the country can know that they can fill out their ballot from the safety and convenience of their home and be sure that that vote will be counted. Okay, ranked choice voting. So it's probably most you know from many elections here in the United States, we have a primary and that selects one candidate from each of the two major parties. Um, but because only the most partisan voters participate in that primary, they often select um, the more extreme candidates from their party. And then in the general election, voters just see those two extreme candidates on the ballot. So even if they might have preferred somebody um, different, they don't have other options. And even if a third party or an independent candidate runs, they can rarely um, win in that general election. So they are more likely to serve as a spoiler for the major party candidate who is most similar to them. Uh, ranked choice of voting allows voters to rank their candidates in order of preference. And by using this kind of a ballot, a jurisdiction can eliminate that primary entirely, or at least replace it with an open primary that allows more than two candidates to compete in the general election. So in Washington, we have um, top two, but with ranked choice voting, you don't have to limit it to top two um, because voters can rank their preferences. So you could have a top, a top four. Uh, primary and voters then have more options. They get more, they hear more um, policy discussion, they hear more options in the campaign, and then they can express options if they choose on the ballot. And it also gives uh, third party chance, uh, third party candidates a chance to participate in this election without being labeled as a spoiler. Ranked choice voting also has been shown to have other benefits such as tamping down negative campaigning because candidates are competing to be uh, the second choice for voters and so they, it's not as advantageous for them to just tear down each other. Um, so there's lots of places across the country that are already using ranked choice voting and um, it had some big wins in this election. So a statewide ballot initiative in Alaska one, so in future, Alaskans will be able to, to vote in an open top four primary and then a ranked choice general election for their governor, their state legislatures, uh, the US Congress and the president. Uh, Alaska is the second state after Maine to adopt ranked choice voting for state and federal elections and other states might uh, follow suit. Uh, ranked choice voting also won in cities. So notably, Albany, California, 72% of voters voted to adopt multi-winner ranked choice voting, which will let them um, elect a more representative city council. And it will ensure that almost all voters have a chance to put someone they want on the council. Um, and then other cities in Colorado, California, Minnesota, um, voters passed ranked choice voting by pretty wide margins. Okay, let's talk about the Electoral College. This is probably on many of our minds these days. And as probably many of us know, in two of the past six presidential elections, the candidate who won more votes lost the election. So that has huge implications, not just for, for which party wins, but for which bills can get passed, which federal judges can get confirmed, and also just how people trust in our democracy. How do we hold our heads up and say that we're a preeminent example of democracy when the loser wins the most important office in the land a third of the time? And how do 
we as advocates for um, better democracy or climate or inequality or any other issue convince Americans to spend their time on this activism, on trying to get action on the issues they care about when they can't even be sure that turning out more voters for a candidate will make that candidate win. So the good news here is the Constitution does not say it needs to work this way. The Constitution says each state gets to decide what to do with its electoral college votes. And over time, most states eventually decided that it was in their best interest to do this state winner take all system where they give all of their electoral college votes to the candidate who won the most votes in that state. States didn't start out doing this it, this way, they decided to do it over time. So they could decide to do it differently. Each state could decide to give its electoral votes to the candidate who wins the most votes in the country. And if states uh, controlling at least 270 electoral votes decided to do it this way, then the candidate who wins the most votes would always win the electoral college. So this is called the National Popular Vote Interstate Compact. It is a mouthful, but a really important one. And states with 196 electoral votes have already signed on. So those are the dark green states in this map. And this map, um, each hex is showing one electoral college vote. So you can sort of see visually, you get a sense of how many votes each state has in the electoral college. Um, the lighter green states are ones that have passed the compact through at least one house. And if all of those could get it through both houses and signed, then the compact would have 284 votes, which is plenty for it to take effect. Um, so advocates are working now on passing this through enough states in the next few years to make the race for president in 2024 be a race for the most votes. This will not be easy. You have probably noticed on this map that most of the states that have signed on already are blue states. And with Biden winning um, the most votes by a landslide, that might convince more Republicans um, that Republican candidates can't win the most votes in this country. And so it is in their interest to keep this state winner take all system where they have a shot at sometimes winning the presidency, even if they never win the most votes. Um, so it might be hard to get some red states to sign on, but it's possible. Um, there are Republicans campaigning for the compact because they believe that the Republican party could shift tactics and have broad appeal again, as in the days of Reagan. And there are voters in these safe red states who are tired of being ignored in, in the presidential campaign and they want their vote to matter. Um, so this compact, it only requires state action. It doesn't need Congress, it doesn't need an amendment, it doesn't need the courts, it just needs states to decide to do this. So because the Electoral College gives small states more votes, it has this result that uh, a Wyoming voters vote counts for four times as much as a Texas voters, which seems pretty unfair on its face, but it does lead to this argument, the most common argument I hear in defense of the winner take all um, electoral college. The idea is that it protects small states. So if we set aside for a moment, the question of why small states need protecting, like what do they need protecting from? Is, is Texas going to invade Wyoming? <laughs> if every American living in Texas, you know, just had one vote, just like every American living in Wyoming. Um, so let's set that aside for a moment, like what are we protecting them from, and just ask, does the state winner take all electoral college protect the political interests of small states? And it turns out that of the 10 smallest states, they split evenly Democrat and Republican. So in any given election, half of the small states don't get the president that the majority of voters wanted. Um, and then add in the fact that these states are pretty much, most of them are safe for one party or the other. 
And they also don't get any attention in the presidential campaigns because they're they're small and they're going to go one way anyway. Um, and so they don't get cam campaign attention. They don't get campaign money. Um, they don't get candidates trying to figure out what their voters want. Instead, the candidates are spending their time and their money and trying to figure out what voters want in battleground states. So here are um, 10 battleground states. And this is where the, the race is really fought. And what you'll see is that these are not small states. These are big states. In fact, six of these are in the top 10 largest states in the nation. Um, so uh, this leads us to this idea that are small states even necessary to win the Electoral College? No. Um, technically, you could win this state winner take all Electoral College um, by just winning the 11 biggest states. You could completely ignore all the small states, all the medium sized states. Um, so the state winner take all Electoral College system is not really helping us small states, it's helping big battleground states. Okay, so another argument I hear in defense of the state winner take all electoral college is that it forces candidates to appeal more broadly across the country to different states, different regions. Also not really true. Um, you could win this state winner take all electoral college model without ever stepping foot east of the Mississippi. Um, in fact, you could win a, a very decisive victory, you, you could win an even narrower victory by ignoring a big part of the Great Lakes region or a big part of the Northeast. Um, you could have a very regionally focused campaign and win the state winner take all electoral college. So a final objection that I hear is that if every vote counted, a candidate could win just by winning in the cities. And this is also not true. There just aren't that many people living in cities. Um, even if you, you know, won by a landslide in every city and, uh, and won, you know, a, a small amount of votes in the other places, you still could not win the most votes this way. So in sum, making every vote count would make every vote count. Um, candidates would have to campaign across the country, not just in big battleground states, they'd have to campaign in rural and suburban areas, not just in urban areas. Um, they would be seeking out votes from Americans everywhere. And we can make that happen by getting more states signed on to the national popular vote interstate compact. So that is just a teaser of three of the solutions in the book and there is so much that we need to do right now. We, we're trying to respond to a global pandemic. We need to fight climate change. We need to fight inequality and to make progress on all of these important issues. We have to have a mechanism for collective action. We need a functioning government. And the bad news is many of our systems here in the United States were just designed, were just not designed to make sure that everyone can vote and that every vote counts. That wasn't uh, just built in to our original systems. But the good news is we can fix those. We can, we can right that ship. Um, we have 10 proven solutions here at our disposal, many of them already in use. And we just need to adopt these solutions everywhere so that the United States can become a democracy that's ready to handle the challenges of the 21st century. Thank you. Great, that's wonderful. Um, Kristen, now we got quite a few questions. I do want to point out that um, Jennifer posted in the chat window that there's a survey that can rank some of the reforms that you're talking about, um, the democracysurvey.org. So you can check that out. I want to go to some of the questions. We have quite a few questions. I'm going to start with John's question is, um, what about other restrictions like witness and notary requirements? for um, the ballots? Uh, for vote by mail, absolutely. The, you know, as I talked about in North Carolina, the witness requirement is um, um, just a burden. There's only two states that have a notary requirement and I think both of them actually waived it this year for 2020. Um, so, and, and North Carolina actually previously required two witnesses and they brought it down to just one this year. Um, so we hope that with all the attention that vote by mail got this year, 
um, and, and the attention that some of those archaic requirements of notaries and witnesses got, that those states will start making moves in the next year to, um, to just update their best practices and not require witnesses, not require notaries, um, have better designed envelopes. That, and we have a whole, the, the book has um, a lot of the best practices and then we also have um, a lot more information about best practices at Sightline. Great. Um, another question we have from Michael is, can you discuss any potential downsides to a vote by mail? For example, you don't get to stay anonymous um, at an actual polling location. Your selections are totally anonymous and thus can't be altered by another person such as a spouse. Yeah, so this is a thing that I've heard um, that, um, you know, historically before the United States had the secret ballot, uh, the open ballot created lots of problems. And so people worry that uh, vote by mail kind of reintroduces those, those problems of an open ballot. And our experience, you know, with two decades of doing this in Oregon and, and many years of doing it in Washington is that that has not, it's not open in the same way. It would really only be open to somebody you live with, such as your spouse. Um, and, um, tampering with somebody's ballot or altering it is of course a, a, a crime and, and uh, punished very severely. And we haven't seen any examples of um, people, of certainly not of races being changed by one spouse. And we haven't seen um, any examples of spouses uh, influencing others' ballots. Um, I think you bring up a good point that, you know, by, you know, um, altering someone's vote or doing anything like that, election fraud is a serious offense. Mm -hmm. And um, we don't see the level of fraud that some people talk about because there is such consequences to actual voter fraud. And I think that doesn't get talked about enough. I just wanted to add that piece. Yeah. And it is, it's very harsh. I mean, it, it's um, it's like five years in jail, it's tens of thousands of dollars of fines. So it's not just a, it's not a slap on the wrist. And if you're someone who, cause a lot of people talk about people that aren't um, citizens voting, but you lose your ability to become a citizen if you're uh, found out to engage in voter fraud. So there's a big disincentive to actually engage in that behavior. Mm -hmm. Um, we have a question from James. Is there any evidence that ranked choice voting can be gamed by insincere groups such as motivating a group of voters to specifically target a candidate for the lowest for the lowest ranking? So that's something that could happen like uh, sometimes when ranked ballots are used in a very small group setting, like just one class um, where there's, you know, everybody kind of knows each other and has a really good idea of the outcome. Um, in the many cities for many years that have been using ranked choice voting in the United States, uh, it has proved, I think, too big of an organizational challenge to A, kind of know who the, the weakest candidate is, as you would have to have very good polling, which we've seen polling isn't always reliable, um, to know who is going to win which matchup, and then enough mobilization to get enough people to, to get that weak um, candidate up into the top two. Um, we haven't seen anybody be able to organize well enough to make that happen in a real world election. Um, the next question from Jim is, does, inter does the interstate compact require congressional appro approval? It does not. That was an easy answer. Um, Jim had a follow-up point. He just asked about congressional approval and he was citing article one, section 10, that no state shall without consent of Congress lay any duty of tonnage, keep troops or ships of war in time of peace, enter any agreement or compact with another state or any foreign power or engage in war unless actually invaded or in such imminent danger as will not admit delay. Yeah, and it turns out that courts have interpreted that section to say that some things fall into that definition of agreements or compacts and other things don't. Um, and I could direct you to um, Larry Lessig and his team have looked into this um, deeply and have concluded that uh, this compact falls into the type of compact that there's a pretty strong court history of saying that it does not require congressional approval. Good, good answer. 
Um, Michael has a question. In the states that have tried but failed to pass the NPVIC, do, do we have any e details on what torpedoed those bills? So it's different things. So actually here in Oregon, it took us, um, we only passed it uh, last year. And the thing that torpedoed it here was that the um, Senate leader refused to bring it to a vote in the Senate. So it, it always had enough votes to pass, um, but he wouldn't bring it to a vote. And he, he's a Democrat, but he was sort of personally opposed to the idea. So, so it can be that level of just like um, you get one person in position of power who doesn't like it and, and they can stop it. Um, it can also be uh, there is a state um, skip, I'm not thinking of it right now, but who passed it actually through both houses. Um, but then the governor, uh, has not, has not signed it. Um, so, um, I don't know if that answers the question, but it, you know, it, it varies a lot. And it's often just like, if you have somebody who's powerful, who opposes it, that can stop it. Well, and no, I know working on bills here in Washington state, if anyone in leadership doesn't want to move a bill forward for a vote, they can prevent it that way as well. So there's a lot of ways that if a legislator doesn't like a bill to stop it, especially if they're in power in a leadership position. Um, I'm going to move on to Alice's question. How many states follow up with mail ballots that have a problem? Curing is another word that we call it. Is this a county by county decision in, in any state? So there's um, 20 states that in state law require a cure process. So in, in those states, it, you know, every, every county, no matter what, has to follow up with voters within a certain amount of time and then give them a certain amount of time to fix their signature. There's another, um, uh, 10 or so states that sort of leave it up to the discretion of the county. So some county administrators might say, hey, this is important, we're gonna follow up and give people a chance to cure. And then um, the rest of the states, the, the state law is silent, which means um, basically you, there's no cure process because counties can't just take it, you know, we have learned this lesson for sure in this election that if there isn't uh, explicit authorization and counties undertake that, then they are then um, vulnerable to some kind of legal challenge. Um, so in those places, um, that is a really key reform um, to pass is making sure that they give voters a chance to fix a problem with their signature if there was one. I, I know in Washington state, we don't know why ballots sometimes are rejected. And that is a bill that we've worked on with the League of Women Voters to have the counties actually say why the ballot was rejected. So we have a better understanding about whose ballots are getting rejected and why. So I think even in Washington state that has a lot of good rules, we still have some work to do. Um, our next question is from Doug, is what was the thinking of the founding fathers when the electoral college was created? Were they afraid of the general public vote and needed a way to make sure proper people are elected for president? So at the time of the, the Philadelphia Constitutional Convention, um, there was no TV, <laughs> no telegraph, no telephone, and it took about three weeks to travel um, from one end of the colonies to the other. And so the founding fathers, um, they talked about having a popular vote for president, but ultimately they just didn't believe it was possible. They thought uh, people just won't be able to know who's running. Um, also at that time, each colony really thought of itself as, um, they didn't think of themselves as the United States, they weren't the United States yet. They each thought of themselves as kind of their own country. So the founding fathers thought, you know, if we have a popular vote for president, each colony will put up its candidate. All the voters in that colony will vote for their own candidate. We'll have thir a 13 way you know, tie and everything will be gridlocked. Um, so instead we should have some people who kind of know everyone, you know, who are movers and shakers who have worked with people across the colonies um, make this wise decision about who is actually the best candidate. So that thinking is obviously 
no longer applicable, both in terms of obviously now we have all these ways of knowing who the candidates are, but also what we saw in 2016 was to the extent that those electors were supposed to be sort of these wise in the know people who were really thinking of the best interests of the country and looking at the candidates and saying, who's really gonna do the best job as president, um, they did not do that. Next question from Alex. If the Senate flips with Georgia races in January, what do you think the chances are for HR1, he said HB1, but I believe they're talking about HR1 to become law or should we go for that? Um, and we are a group that supports HR1 because there's a lot of reforms in there. If people don't know that it's called For the People Act and it may have a different number than HR1 next time. Yeah, HR1 is great. It has so many of the reforms that we need in it. I'm sure it would pass the house again, um, The, but it would need to get past a filibuster in the Senate most likely. And that would be very hard is my guess. Can you talk a little bit about the filibuster? I think that is an issue that really holds up reforms getting moved forward. Um, how can we address that issue? Uh, yeah, the, by getting enough votes to get rid of the filibuster. Um, and I think that that is a topic that has gained some momentum amongst Democrats this year. It used to be that that was a kind of a no-go. Democrats thought, you know, it's really important to have um, this, you know, encouragement to have broader support for things and the filibuster plays an important role in blocking bad things. Um, but the longer that we go with it, just blocking everything, um, the more that some senators are willing to uh, reconsider it, but it would take probably Democrats, you know, not just having a, a the bare majority that they would have if, if they win both races in Georgia, but having even more to, to get work up the courage to get rid of it. I want to stay on HR1 because we have another question from Amy is, is there what's missing in terms of, of reform, effective reform in that bill? There's a lot of there's a lot in that bill, money in elections, voting, um, all kinds of stuff, ethics. Um, what what else is could be in there? Um, so HR1 has, yeah, it has um, standards around vote by mail, so improvements um, to the way the states implement it. It could have more detail around that. And um, what we've seen is um, there's a lot more implementation details to be worked out. It includes um, having states be a member of the uh, Electronic Registration Information Center, um, a better voting, voting rights protection. So it has a lot of great stuff, especially around voting rights and money and politics. Uh, the thing that it's missing, well, it's a separate bill, is the um, the, the Fair Voting Act, which would um, create multi-winner districts for Congress, multi-winner ranked choice voting districts for Congress, um, which would um, sort of break some of this hyper-polar two-party gridlock, which is um, kind of the reason the filibuster has become so powerful is because of this hyperpolarization and that those multi-winner ranked choice voting districts would break that dynamic. Yeah, and for folks that don't know, that was HR4 and it's now called the John Lewis Voting Advancement Act. And it's also to correct that Supreme Court decision, Shelby County versus Holder back from 2013 that basically gutted the Voting Rights Act. Yeah. Um, a comment from John is not in the book, but relevant to our current events. What policy should be passed to prevent abuse of executive power and other authoritarian actions by the president? Uh, that I will have to defer to somebody else. I haven't thought about that a lot or enough to comment on it, but it's super important, <laughs> obviously extremely important for the health of our democracy. I do know that there is a group working on accountability um, issues, including that. Um, so look for a bill that will be introduced. It was tried to get introduced the last session, but didn't get anywhere. But I know there is a group working on that. I've seen drafts of some of that. So maybe I'll do a whole event on that one day. <laughs> um, 
so next question from Donna, can you talk about proportional representation and how we can get there? That's a great topic. Yeah, so that uh, the, the, the federal bill I was just mentioning with the multi-winner districts, that's a way of getting to proportional representation at the federal level. Um, but probably we need some more examples of proportional representation at the local and state levels in order to build um, more support for that bill. Um, and uh, Fair Vote Washington is thinking about how to uh, do a bill or a ballot initiative to get proportional representation for the state legislature in Washington. And here in Portland, there are some groups working on trying to get proportional representation for the city of Portland, which would then just give us an example of it working. And uh, did I answer the question? <laughs> So I, I would just want to uh, mention, why don't you explain what proportional representation is, you know, because some people may not understand that term. Yeah, so proportional representation, it's a kind of an umbrella term. There's lots of different ways of voting that can get you there. Um, but the basic idea is that um, the legislature proportionally reflects the voters. So if 40% of the voters voted for a Democrat and 20% for Green Party, then your legislators would be about 40% Democrat, 20% Green Party, et cetera. Um, and so it's, it's our current system, because it's a two-party system, it really distorts um, the vote to representation um, uh, ratio. So uh, it gives huge extra seats to the two major parties um, compared to what voters might support for third parties. And it often gives uh, especially more support to one party it, right now. And at this part of our history, that's the Republican Party who can often win majority control of a legislator legislature, even though they only had a minority of support from voters. So proportional representation makes it so that that, that can't happen. If you get 40%, you only get 40%. You don't win control of the legislature. And one common way to do that would be with something called single transferable vote, where you use ranked choice voting, but with multi-member districts. So you elect people all at once rather than electing them in single one person at a time in a district, you can elect multiple people at the same time. Um, do you have a preference on the type of proportional representation voting systems? That's the one I'm most familiar with. Yeah, my preference is the one that can win. Um, and it's um, for the United States, likely that is the one you just talked about. You have a multi-winner district and you rank your candidates. Um, and the reason that is probably more likely in the United States is it's a candidate-based system. Some of the other voting systems are party-based. So um, you just vote for a party and then the party decides how to fill its seats. Or sometimes um, a party will list its candidates and then you can pick the particular candidate, but they're sort of listed um, by party. Um, and then there's uh, the, the New Zealand system. So New Zealand, like the United States, um, so places that have a two-party system like the United States are pretty much former British colonies. So um, New Zealand, Australia, India, United States, Canada. And New Zealand up until the 90s was like us. They had single winner districts. They had um, a two-party domination and they decided to get rid of it. And the system that they went to is um, called mixed member proportional. So they keep some of their seats are still single single winner districts. So you still have that sort of my, my local rep. And then the rest of the seats are by party list. And so you, you get two votes. You get to vote for your local representative and then for your national party. And then the national party um, fills those seats depending on how many votes they get. So various ways of getting there, the one that seems most likely to win in the United States to me is the multi-winner ranked choice voting. And that's what, there's a federal bill for that right now. Great. Um, we're back to the interstate compact questions. David wants to know why does the interstate compact not require congressional approval? Um, because that he believes that the constitution um, states that compacts between states must get congressional approval. And I can, uh, send you more information on the legal arguments. I'm not, um, that, that is the summary that I know is the courts have interpreted compacts to, for, to which that applies. Some of them, it doesn't apply that requirement. And this compact um, 
falls into the former category. But I can give you more details on that if you want to follow up with me, Kristen at sightline.org. Great, thank you. Um, and speaking of the compact, under the compact, if the national popular vote were close, would it be hard to verify the results? Yeah, so, um, you know, we all remember, well, some of us who are old enough remember 2000 where uh, the election was hanging by a few hundred votes and thinking, well, what if the national election were hanging by that number of votes and, you know, would we have to do a recount nationally? Um, so some of that is, you know, we do, we should be doing risk limiting audits of every election to make sure that our vote counting systems are, um, uh, are reliable down to the, the vote so that even if there were a national election that were close, we would have confidence um, and that that vote count had come out correctly because we had been doing these audits all along. And um, Dwight asks, what minor parties, if any, have advocated for ranked choice voting? Um, so, um, like minor parties here in the Pacific Northwest are generally, so there's a, there's a network, the independent voter network that has um, people who are, um, you know, just individuals or, or leadership for independent voting or third party voting. And um, it definitely advocates for ranked choice voting as a way to give better ballot access to um, third parties. And I would say that um, single winner ranked choice voting kind of gives an in, you know, where you just have one winner in a ranked ballot. That gives a little bit more flexibility for third parties. But the thing that really lets third parties start to win seats and win some um, power is proportional representation where one type is multi-winner ranked choice voting. And so I'd say third parties are definitely um, in favor of and advocate for that proportional representation. Yeah, I, I know I've worked with the Green Party and other groups like that, even independents have been advocating more for ranked choice voting in the state I've seen. Uh, Marilyn asks, if the Electoral College college isn't abolished outright, wouldn't it be more representative to assign electors proportionally according to the popular votes in each given state? And I think Lawrence Lessig has been advocating for something like this as well. Yep, that is one way of doing it. The downside is you still have this distortion that the, the electoral votes um, don't match the population. So even if you were able to do it, uh, proportionally with the votes they're given, that's not going to end up uh, being a very accurate reflection of the voters across the country. Um, the other problem is just like, how do you get votes? How do you get states to do that? Because um, the reason that states started out mostly doing that and then moved to the state winner take all is they realized they just had more power, they had more clout. Um, and so to get enough states to do it in the more proportional method, you'd have to have something like this national interstate compact where it's a, a mutual disarmament. And if you're gonna go for mutual disarmament, why not just go for a straight undistorted uh, every vote counts equally. And Norm has a lot here written. I'm gonna to try to summarize a little bit. He's talking about the platitude that duopoly first past the post gerrymandering promotes more extreme candidates. And he says that's only within the GOP here in Washington and other plates. We have what's called a bipartisan redistricting commission, but it tends to keep people that are in power, incumbents in power. Um, and so how would you address that? Um, do you, how about redistricting reform that it'd be more, so it doesn't just keep incumbents in power, especially you know within the Democrats, we see that quite often. Yeah, so redistricting reform, um, well, I mean, as we see in Washington, Washington sometimes held up uh, nationally as an example of independent redistricting. And as you've just pointed out, that uh, doesn't always mean everything is hunky-dory. Um, so I go back to the multi-winner proportional districts. So if you have the thing that gives districting so much power right now, um, why you can use it to gerrymander or you can use it to keep incumbents in power is because when you have a single winner district, you can draw that district and sort of know who's going to be the winner. 
Um, but with a multi-winner district, you can't know that. If you've got five people are gonna win from that district, you don't, you can't draw it in such a way that you guarantee a certain winner um, for all five of those seats. And so it um, inherently creates more competition in which the voters have more power rather than the line drawers having all of the power. Um, so my, uh, the best way to uh, design redistricting is to draw multi-winner districts. And I do want to call out that in Yakima County right now, there's a case under the Washington Voting Rights Act that's looking at alternatives um, to get um, people, uh, Latinx people elected. There's only ever had one to the commission, even though it's a majority Latino, um, Latinx uh, district. Um, do you know about that case? Yeah, um, and that was, uh, you know, at the time that the, there was a court case that said that they had to go to districts and um, dis, you know, single winner districts only, uh, only work so well. Um, and so n now they are considering that maybe in order to get fairer representation, they need to have a multi-winner district with ranked choice voting. Yeah, we're keeping an eye on that when I'm on the coalition for that and we're watching that one closely. Um, Jim just has a comment. He said, uh, Joe Manchin has said he will not support elimination of the 60 vote uh, filibuster. So, which makes it really difficult when you have people not supporting it to get it done. Yeah. It means we may need to elect other people that are more willing to do that kind of reform. And, and I, you know, working in Olympia, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle, but people don't like to change things that will take them out of power. Yes. And regardless of what party they're in. So, which is very difficult. Um, Ken says, how does the National Popular Vote Compact's possible requirement that the legislature send a contingent of electors that conflicts with the majority vote in the state differ from the tactic that Trump was trying to get legislators in Michigan and Pennsylvania to do? Yeah, so Trump was trying to get, so so each state are, has on the books um, some kind of law saying how they're going to uh, decide what electors to send. And so for almost all states, that is uh, something saying, we will send the electors that are pledged to the candidate who won the most votes. And so that those laws are on the book and what Trump was trying to do was get them to violate that law after the fact. Um, what this would do is change that law on the books before the presidential election so that everybody knows what the law is going in and then they just follow that law depend you know what whatever happens what whichever way the election goes. Um, so that's you know ha having the law and then following it is different than having the law and then trying to not follow it. Yeah, and we know he's done a lot of that, trying to find ways around that. Yeah. Um, Joseph asks about ranked choice voting. He feels it's equally susceptible to the same spoiler problems as first past the post, um, like in places like Australia. And he was talking about um, a stronger momentum maybe for alternative voting, like score, runoff, or approval. What, what are your thoughts about some of those other types of um, alternative voting systems? Yeah, so there's the other other ways of um, kind of overcoming a lot of the problems of plurality voting. So approval um, is where you can vote for as many candidates as you want, and score is um, where you get to give them a score, basically kind of like a Yelp rating. You know, you give them up to five stars, and then uh, um, score runoff voting is a hybrid of ranked choice voting. First, you give them a score, and then it selects the top two, and then it it translates it into a ranking and then gives um, them your rank. Um, so all of those are definitely um, improvements on plurality voting and can solve some of the problems. But in terms of momentum, um, you, I mean, you saw the map where choice voting is um, happening across the country. It just won in Alaska. It's been in use in Maine. It won in New York City. It won in all these cities. Um, and um, I believe approval voting is being used in Fargo and St. Louis. And I, to my knowledge, score voting is not being used in any public election anywhere. Score voting is not used in any public election anywhere. So um, in terms of, of, of momentum and you know, Americans having experience using it, um, ranked choice voting 
has a significant edge. And uh, I want to just ask you what your thoughts about how those systems work in a proportional representation system. Are they, because I have seen evidence that they don't work as well in multi-member districts. Yeah, so approval voting, the sort of um, equivalent, the, the, the multi-winner version would be probably like block voting, you know, where you, you have three candidates and you can get, you can vote for three. And that does not result in a proportional result at all. Um, uh, score voting and score runoff voting have proportional methods, um, but from what I've seen there, they do not have as consistently proportional results as multi-winner ranked choice voting. So that is another um, uh, mark in the favor of ranked choice voting that the single winner method pairs well with a very proportional multi-winner method. Um, Suzanne wants to know, with regard to the voting power of cities, how did you determine the number of voters? Where were, were you counting the large metro areas and since urbanization will put more people in urban areas, even as rural population shrink? Is that a factor? Um, yeah, so I just looked at all cities um, and then I kind of cross verified that with, um, so there's, there's some disagreement about exactly how to categorize places as cities or not. Like, should you do it by density? Is it just by the metropolitan area? And so I looked at um, some survey data from the census that asked people, just asked them, like, do you live in an urban neighborhood or a suburban or a rural or something else? And um, the answers to that survey matched pretty well with just looking at cities. 27% uh, of people said that they live in an urban area. And if you just look at the population of cities, um, cities over 200,000 have about 21% of the population and any city like, you know, going all the way down to like a city with 7,000 people, which, you know, we, I don't know if we think of that as a super urban area um, is about 30%. So um, any way you slice it, it's just not enough people to win an election. I just realized we are almost out of time. This is just going by so quickly. Um, we're gonna take one last question from Joseph. I'm sorry, everyone, we couldn't get to all the questions, but what do you think about sortitioning? This is an interesting topic uh, where legislators work like jury duty, no elections, just random selection where citizens get to get picked and they solve issues. Chapter 10, I love it. Great, that's, that's an interesting topic, sortition. Um, and I think some countries are experimenting more with that type of system where, um, especially in solving issues, um, trying to come up with solutions to problems within a city or a jurisdiction, they pick people randomly and then they give them information and then they you know, figure out what the solution is. That, yeah. that is an interesting topic. Yeah. Um, and for anybody who didn't, if we didn't get to your question, I'd be very happy to to talk to you um, after. Yes, please uh, go ahead. And um, your email again is Kristen at sightline.org. And so you can reach her there. Um, one last thing is what can people do going from here? That That's sort of my question. What, what can the average person do to help support these reforms? Yeah, so the book, you know, part of what I'm hoping with the book is to really connect people with that action. And so each chapter has um, organizations that are working on making that issue a reality. So I would say, you know, get the book. And then the book also has each chapter has discussion questions. So get it, talk to your friends and family about it, and then contact the organizations that are listed to be part of making these solutions real. Great, and I know Fixed Democracy First, we basically work on all of these issues um, with groups like the League of Women Voters, Fair Vote Washington and other groups. And I just wanna thank you so much. This was very informative. I think we could have gone on another hour with the questions, really good topic. Maybe we'll have you come back and do a second part, but thank you um, for being here and, and sharing this. I'm excited to read your book. I haven't had a chance to read it yet. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us tonight. Good night, everyone. Thank you.